Hey folks, it's Dave Burrows, uh, Chief Investment Strategist and President of Barometer Capital Management. Thanks so much for tuning in today. Uh, we're going to try and move fairly quickly today. We got lots to cover, uh, and uh, and so why don't we just get going? Um, here we are at the beginning of 2023. We're one week in. Market's already tipped its hand just a little bit. We'll talk about that. Uh, we're going to talk mostly from a high level today because, as we know, in our view. 70% of return comes from getting to the right parts of the market. So we got to talk about positioning as we start the year, because it's really important that we get off on the right foot, wind up focused on the right asset classes within those groups, find the sectors that matter. Where is it that is going through some kind of structural change that can be revalued? And then, of course, we can spend time over the course of the year talking about specific securities. But we're going to talk specifically today on the macro uh, because there's some really important messaging that we're taking away from what's going on recently uh, and as it relates to this bear market that we've been going through through the course of 2022 uh, and what things might look like over the course of the year. So let's let's get going uh, and we're going to move fairly fast. So just from a top-down perspective, we continue to think that we're in a structural bull market in equities. I know this is an unpopular view, but it's a pretty clear when we look at it this way, uh, bull markets tend to be lower bound by a rising 200-week moving average. Uh, that was the case all the way through the 80s and 90s until ultimately, after the rollover in the tech bull market, markets chopped their way sideways for 13 years. So it's not to say that can't happen again, and it will at some point in the future. But at this point, we continue to be above this rising 200-week moving average. We continue to be in a bull market. And the market is doing a lot of really important internal work. But just to take a surface level view, if in fact the structural bull market was over at this point after a rally of 157% uh, over 119 months, that would be awfully short relative to what we've seen in the past. Bull market of the 80s and 90s was 1,300% over 217 months, just about twice as long as what we've gone through so far and lots more uh, upside action along the way. So um, when we look at the bond market, bond market reversed a bull market or falling interest rates that started in 1981 in 2020. And we had a little consolidation as we broke through all the moving averages. We moved higher again. We consolidated again. But clearly, rates are in a longer term uptrend at this point. And that was a major regime change from what we saw over the last 40 years. If you look at the long end of the U.S. bond market, the TLH was the, the 10 to 20 year U.S. government bond ETF uh, from top to bottom was down 42.8%. And certainly we bounced off that low, but we've seen a series of failing lower highs in price. And at this point, we are not willing to go out on a limb and say all clear rates clearly look as though they had higher. So that makes bonds pretty unattractive other than very short-term bonds as a place to hold short-term cash. Let's compare equities versus bonds. This is the spider SPY versus the TLH, the long end of the US bond market. And you can see for many years, the uh, SPY relative to bonds has been outperforming and that continues. So it doesn't mean that that can't be challenged at some point in the future. But when people talk about this being like 2008, it's nothing like 2008. This was 2008, nine stocks versus bonds, a very different picture. So stocks continue to carry the ball as a leadership asset from an asset allocation perspective. When we look at commodities, commodities broke this very long downtrend or bear market that they were in starting in 2008. In 2020, the end of the year, they rallied until April of this year and have consolidated above the long-term moving average over the last number of months, looks to me like that's getting awfully ready to shift. And when we compare commodities, the DBC, which is a broad-based commodity ETF, versus the S&P 500, we broke that downtrend in the early part of 2022. And as I say, have consolidated, but we've consolidated from above the trend line. So I would say here, Equ uh, commodities actually more attractive than equities. And certainly part of equity markets would be well uh, uh, coordinated with the commodity move higher, the commodities producers. Uh, but certainly it's probably the beginning, not the end. And this is an important group to watch this year. 
Goldman Sachs, by their estimation, expect commodity prices to be up on average 43% over the course of this year, building on the only asset class that was positive last year, commodities, and positive returns in 2020. So commodities versus equities, very attractive, and certainly commodities versus bonds, very attractive in holding this long-term uptrend. So if we look at those three basic asset classes, constructive on equities in general, certainly better places and worse places in the world to focus, commodities, positive, fixed income continues to be negative. We think we are in a long-term structural bear market. When we look at real estate, something highly correlated to interest rates, this is the RWR ETF versus the S&P 500, has been underperforming for a long time, but certainly down around the lows and certainly not a place we want to focus currently. And then from a currency perspective, US dollar, which was in a significant uptrend through most of 2021 and 22, broke that uptrend starting in the in September, broke the trend, started breaking moving averages as the 200 day moving average and not showing any sign of reversing at this point. That's a positive for risk assets in general. It's a positive for non-US assets, as we've seen the pound sterling, Japanese yen, uh, and euro rally nicely against the dollar. Dollar down 10% off the highs against that broad basket. Now, there's a lot going on underneath the surface of markets. And we know that when we can find parts of the market that are showing an expanding number of securities participating in a rally, that's constructive. There's no bear markets that ever take place during expanding breadth when more and more securities are performing well. The weakest parts of the market are groups where over time, fewer and fewer securities are able to lead or perform well. And these are the groups we want to stay away from. So you can take the approach, we're going to have a little of everything. Or you can say, let's just focus on those areas of the market that are showing constructive behavior, in our case, measured by those that have expanding breadth. Now, <clears throat> last week, we highlighted that on our long-term indicators, the Canadian breadth model of the percentage of stocks in uptrends maintained its strength that started in October, despite the fact many stock markets backed off. NYSE bullish percent had been reduced and the bullish percent globally had been coming down. But as of last week, the percent of stocks trading above their 50 day moving average or the number of companies trading above that sort of intermediate measure of trend had started to show expansion again. Now, this is important because the NASDAQ uh, composite made a new low two weeks ago. And so we want to look at what's behaving differently. NYSE started to show expansion in the number of stocks trading above the 50-day moving average, but the short-term indicators all had come down through the month of December as we saw equity markets correct and start to retest those October lows. When we look at the NASDAQ, as we mentioned, this was the low in October. We had a closing low at just slightly below that level in December, but interestingly, 20% of companies in uptrends in October 30% of companies in the NASDAQ composite in uptrends in December. That's a divergence. That's better internal behavior for the market. And we've moved higher from there. If we looked at the S&P, it looked a lot better. S&P obviously still dominated by large cap tech. There's very large positions at the top of the index. But in October, 10% of the 500 companies were in uptrends as defined by a point and figure price chart. When the NASDAQ was retesting the low, actually 42% of all the companies in the S&P were already making higher highs and higher lows. That's a positive divergence. That's a bottoming action. That's retesting lows, but with far fewer stocks getting hurt. As of this week, the picture has continued to improve. The S&P up about 2% as of yesterday, versus the beginning of the year. The short-term indicators in Canada, the US and globally getting better. Percent of stocks with positive weekly price momentum reversing back higher again. Percent of stocks trading, making new highs versus new lows turning higher. And percent of stocks trading above the 150 day moving average moving higher. Now what's significant about this is similar to looking at those bullish percent readings we're seeing some positive divergences. In October, 
the percent of stocks trading above their 50 day moving average, only 6%. As of today, 56%. Percent of stocks trading above their 150 day moving average, only 12% of companies were trading above that long term measure of trend. As of yesterday, 54% of all of the companies on the NYSE were trading above their 150 day moving average. So it may be some very large cap stocks continue to behave poorly, but internally, there's a bunch of companies trading much better than they were in October. And that's an internal diversion that tells us there's healing taking place. The percentage of stocks with positive weekly momentum or upward trajectory in October, only 8%. As of yesterday, 41.52% of stocks trading with positive weekly momentum. That's upward trajectory. And the percent of stocks making new lows versus new highs in October, 4%, 54% of companies making uh, higher highs. So these are important data points. And it may sound like just technical jargon, but the fact is we want to know what's happening underneath the surface, not just what's happening on the surface. Looking at it another way, if you looked at net new highs versus new lows in October, lots of companies making new lows. When the market made a test here, look at this, almost no new lows. Yesterday was only nine new lows in the entire NYSE. That's the lowest reading since the fall of 2021. This is definite improvement. When we look at the number of companies with very weak relative strength versus the market, 45% of companies in October, almost zero as of this past week. So lots of internal improvement. And I want to be careful with what I say, but this is bottoming price action. And I know there's a lot of views that the Fed's not done tightening yet and the economic data is going to get worse. But the market has been chewing over these issues now for over 12 months. And in the case of unprofitable tech, for 20 months. So let's take an even better measure. Let's look at the Dow Industrials. Now, we've talked about the fact that industrials in general will be the beneficiary of re-onshoring into the U.S., which may be a theme over the next 10 years as companies want to become less dependent on what's going on in China and more dependent on their own domestic market. In October, 4% of Dow Industrials companies were in uptrends. As of this uh, uh, 10 days ago, 60% of constituents were in uptrends. And as of today, 65% of all the companies in the Dow Industrials are trading in uptrends. Not only that, Price is now trading above the 21-day, the 8-day, the 50-day moving average, the 200-day moving average. The, 50 day moving average, the, 200 day moving average. the uh, moving average convergence divergence indicators just turned positive and relative strength is picking up. So we think that certainly while the NASDAQ has continued to be sloppy, there are parts of the market showing their hand. We want to watch for what's strong early because these are the groups we want to own as people start to shift their stance from very, very defensive and underinvested to slowly dipping their toes in the water. So this picture tells a thousand stories. This is the Dow Industrials relative to the QQQ. So industrials versus technology. Outperformed during the tech wreck. Tech outperformed from 2003 until 2021, we started to see a turn and we've made enough of a turn to break this long-term trend. That's a regime change. Once that happens, it's likely to go on for a long time. And so we want to make sure we're positioned to take advantage of it. The equal weight S&P versus the market cap weighted ETF. So this is where we take every one of the 500 companies and compare them to what's going on to the cap weighted. And we see again, improvement versus the equally weighted. Now we talked last week about the fact we have been seeing a slowdown in the CPI uh, inflation data, the consumer inflation data. Uh, that certainly is getting better. We know we've had now three months where if we were to annualize the number, it's around a 3% inflation number, which is close to where the Fed wants to see it. We know with their rate hikes, they have slowed down the leading indices. 
the leading leading um, uh, indicators for the economy. They want to do that. We know that uh, market analysts have been taking down their earnings estimates for 2023. And the market's been digesting all of it. In this past week, we had additional data that that showed a slowing. We saw the consumer services inflation uh, and PMI data come in well below expectation, even though employment continues to be strong. And that actually speaks against a hard landing. Let's talk about leadership. I think these pictures tell us a lot. On October the 6th, as the market was making its low, if we took all of the 41 sectors we track and put them on a distribution curve, tracking what percent of securities are performing well, you can see all of the sectors are stacked up at this far left-hand side, meaning they very few companies were performing well, almost everything performing poorly. That's what a market looks like when it's making a low. Last week, when we retested the lows in the NASDAQ, look at the movement to the right, meaning that by sector, more and more companies performing well. So we know, we talked about last week, that oil and oil service, banks, steel companies, insurance, aerospace builders, all had between 40 and 60% of their constituents performing better. That's improvement. These are the groups that are seeing the net buying. And this week, even more. Actually, if we took all the sectors on average, the average sector had 38% of its constituents in uptrends versus only 24% in October. And a lot more have turned into capital letters, which mean they're showing expanding breadth or healthy behavior. So at the market level, at the sector level, we're seeing change for the better. Now, I know there's a tremendous number of things to worry about. China has been a problem, but maybe it's getting better. They're starting to reopen and actually opening aggressively. We know that there have been, there's been deadlock in the U.S. politically, but certainly there's money to be spent on infrastructure and water infrastructure that's coming at us. We know there's a theme in re-onshoring manufacturing to the U.S., and that's going to take materials and industrial equipment. So it shouldn't be a surprise that when we look at all of the groups, one of the strongest groups are industrial materials, a group made up of steel, chemicals, metals, precious metals, all of them showing expanding breadth, all of them showing rising relative performance versus the S&P, and trading way off the lows. FXZ is an ETF, was trading at $50 on October the 6th, trading at $65 today from a percentage point move, significant, now trading above all the long-term moving averages and technically breaking out to a level we haven't seen since June of 2022. When we look at the gold miners, which we've talked more about over the last few months, even more significant improvement. 12% of companies in uptrends in October, 42% as of the end of December, 48% today, and we're breaking out of this reverse head and shoulders pattern, which is a market bottoming pattern. So these groups are showing leadership. These groups have been underappreciated for years. These groups have seen very little new investment in capital equipment and in capacity. Financials, again, a much higher low in December than we saw in October. 50% of companies in uptrends in December, 54% today, breadth expanding, trading above all the long-term moving averages. And this includes a bunch of different groups, but specifically banks, investment banks, and insurance companies, all companies that thrive if capital markets are doing better, not worse. This is the oil and gas services ETF. In fact, today broke out to a new multi-year high. Now, energy producers have been a little weaker over the last few weeks, but we know there's a structural deficit and we know companies have not invested in new, uh, new drilling. And we are certainly seeing a pickup and certainly the market is expecting this to continue. 22% of companies in uptrends in, in, in September 
when we look at where we are today, 48% in uptrends. So there's some real areas of strength. This ETF bottomed out at $50. It's at $83 today. So you can't tell me that there aren't places that we can be that are behaving constructive. And when something is strong in the face of weakness, if things just start to get a little better, look at the move we've seen since kind of December 20th, $70 to $83, moving nicely higher. In the consumer, home builders, you know, I'm scratching my head like many others are. If you think that there is a recession coming and that rates are high, home builders and home construction equipment should not be doing well. But again, starting to come out of this reverse head and shoulders bottoming pattern, trading above all the moving averages. So there most definitely are things to do. I talked last week about the fact that when the tech market bottomed in the fall of 2020, sorry, 2002, Apple was $3. When the market made a lower low in March of 2003, Apple was $6. It went on to be leadership for the next several years. These are the clues we want to take away from what's going on market. From a thematic standpoint, dividend growth ETF versus Sorry, this is verse. Sorry, this is growth versus value. Uh, sorry, uh, value versus growth. Value outperforming for the first time in a long time. Dividend growth versus the S and P. If we take this subset, dividend growers versus the broad based S and P, we can see for the first time in several years, dividend growers are one of the strongest parts of the market. Now, I want to circle back to something we've talked about over the last year. When you get rising interest rates or bond markets go into bear markets, you should expect that dividend growers are going to do better than fixed income because we need a rising stream of dividends to offset a rising inflation tide. So we think, again, this is the beginning of a re regime change, not the end. And then dividend growth as a theme versus bonds themselves. Well, now you can see we've been seeing outperformance since the early part of 2020. And again, that doesn't appear to be abating. So there's some really important clues to take away. We don't know what's going to happen over the course of the year. It looks as though inflation is slowing. It looks as though China is reopening. It looks as though uh, the consumer is in decent shape. Travel numbers are, are, are at recent record highs. And internally, there are groups certainly bucking the trend from a market perspective. Let's talk about positioning. Industrials continue to be our largest weight. And this includes, of course, some of the defense companies we've talked about. It includes companies like Caterpillar and Ingersoll Rand and John Deere. These are companies that are going to be important in the reonshoring in the U.S. And also investment in basic materials. There's a lot of capital, a lot of, a lot of Caterpillar equipment. Financials, we've got a significant overweight with a significant weight in insurance and large investment banks. We have a significant stake in materials, which is actually almost four times the weight in the S&P. But we think this weighting in the S&P will go up as we've only just begun a new longer term bull market. We've got about an equal weight in healthcare, which has been a defensive category to focus in as performing well. We've got an overweight position in energy, but at this point, we have a little bit more in the energy service side than in the energy producers. And then also along with healthcare from a defensive standpoint, we've got this basically market weight in consumer staples. We continue to be underweight consumer services, underweight technology, underweight utilities, and underweight real estate, all things that are tied to interest rates. Now quickly outside the US, Europe continues to perform well. Of all of the shocks, of all of the things, areas that would be most impacted by this Ukraine war with Russia, European companies performing well. Why? Well, they've been out of favor for a long time. A strong US dollar made them unattractive. And certainly when growth stocks were outperforming, not a lot of growth stocks in Europe. European markets are more made up of value-oriented sectors. Now the U.S. dollar is weakening. We're getting a tailwind both from the companies themselves and from the currency. Again, 22% of companies in uptrends in October, 50% of uptrends, companies in uptrends today. And we're making the first 
uh, making the highest level we've been at since March of 2022, almost a year ago. So look, in October, we highlighted that after nine months of very negative returns, historically, the next three months might be mixed, but the next six months overwhelmingly positive. Well, we're three months out from that now. And when we look from here to one year, three years, five years, and 10 years, it tends to be you're out of the woods and on your way into the next bull market. Now, again, we don't know what's going to happen for sure. But what I do know is that the S&P is up just over 2% since the beginning of the year. And there's an old saying that says, as goes the first week of the year, so goes the rest of the year for the stock market. When we take all the data since 1950, if you took the average year, it was up 9.1%. We know averages don't mean much because there's good years and bad years, but 71% of years were positive. When the first five days were positive, the average return was 14%, a full 5% higher in 81% of the cases. But when you had the first five days up greater than 1%, like this year, the average return was 15.4% and positive 87% of the time. So look, we don't make decisions based on this kind of data. I make decisions based on what's happening underneath the surface, where is their strength? Where is their weakness? What should we add to? What should we avoid? But I think that the themes that were showing up through the late part of 2022 are the same themes that are showing up here in the beginning of 2023. And we are progressing step-by-step step toward the next leg of a long-term bull market. If things were to turn lower, if Fed Chair Powell is able to be hawkish enough to scare the market or the economic data that is already discounting a slowdown has to discount an even faster slowdown. We're perfectly happy to get defensive. But at this point, I think it is less a time to be fearful and more a time to be contrarian and invested and ready to take advantage of the major structural themes that have tailwinds coming behind us. And with that, if there's any questions, certainly happy to answer them. Uh, let's see what we got. Have to bear with me for a moment because I'm working on my own today. Uh, Q and A. Uh, so uh, Sebastian asks, "What are our thoughts on Canadian banks and Canadian insurance companies, U.S. banks and U.S. insurance companies?" So just to be clear, as we talked about earlier, the financials are a group that we do like. We are have an overweight position. Uh, we have a significant overweight position in insurance, both in Canada uh, and in the U.S., largely property and casualty. Intact is a position that we own. Progressive is a position we own in the U.S. Uh, and we own some of the large investment banks from an from a individual bank perspective in Canada. Uh, we own some TD. We own some Royal. Uh, both of them behaving you know, quite well and paying us a nice yield. Uh, Anne asks us, with the U.S. in a downtrend, should I move U.S. dollars back to Canadian dollars or U.S. stocks to Canadian stocks? And that's a great question. In the pools and the funds that we run, we are 100% right now hedged back to Canadian dollars. In the separately managed accounts that we manage, we definitely have skewed our holdings to Canadian stocks from U.S. stocks. And that's partly because the Canadian market is really well suited to some of the leadership themes that we see right now in the market. Certainly energy materials well represented in the Canadian market, companies like Tech Resources, uh, First Quantum, and so on. Uh, and from a currency perspective, yes, if you've got U.S. dollars, I think this is probably a good time to be buying Canadian dollars. Because if we think that uh, basic materials and commodities can do quite well, that tends to be a tailwind for the Canadian dollar, also a tailwind for the Australian dollar. Now, remember, we're only just beginning to see China reopen, and they are the largest consumer of energy and commodities on the planet. So we're likely to see, even though there's a deficit right now from an inventory perspective, an even greater deficit, and that means higher prices. And then the last question I have is a question from Chris, and he's asking if we still like uh, GUNR ETF. So look, here's the longer term perspective. 
There's a five-year chart. GUNR is a uh, global upstream natural resource index fund. Um, if we look at the bear market in commodity prices, basically from 2014, uh, this is when energy finally rolled over. It was the last strong commodity. GUNR made a low in 2016, rallied, retested the low in 2020, broke out of the range that ended the structural bull market, bear market, pulled back to the moving average, rallied again, pulled back and consolidated through the bear market this past year, and now moving nicely higher. If we make it a shorter term picture, we've just broken this downtrend. We're trading above all of the moving averages. And I think it's very, very constructive. You know, at the end of the day, if we can own these large upstream producers, companies that pay dividends, and that's largely what's in the global, uh, the GUNR, dividend paying resource companies. I think that this is something that's really, really attractive. I talked to somebody today about, um, about Rio Tinto. Uh, this is a great example. Long-term bear market. Uh, that came to an end, we consolidated, and now we're just breaking out of this range. So I think that realistically, this is a group that could provide really significant returns. If commodity prices are up 43% over the course of the year, you can bet that the producers will perform even better. So I think that this is going to be an important source for uh, returns over the course of the year. And with that, let me just see if there's any more questions. No, that's it. Okay, listen, thanks everybody for joining us today. Uh, we're gonna try and keep these a little shorter through the course of uh, 2023. Next week, we expect to have Diana Avigdor on, uh, who's our head of trading at Barometer to talk a little bit about uh, some of the themes that she's seeing uh, from a market structure perspective uh, and some of the positioning that we're seeing. And uh, we'll see how things go. So if you've got questions, don't hesitate to lob them into us either by email or by phone, if you want to have a conversation, reach out. Uh, this is going to be an interesting year. Everyone have a great week.